All right. I want to do this one little thing here. It's a very short video. It's called Why is Obesity? Why Obesity is Not a Choice. Science Explained. Somebody asked that, that I should watch this after I've been talking about fat people. I'm also fat. So I was like, okay, interesting. Because I feel like it's one of those, it's like, it's hard to say whether it is or isn't a choice because it's like, it's uh, like everybody has to eat, right? Um, but at the same time, like overeating is really bad. But then also people overeat like myself. I'll eat, you know, I'll eat when I'm like stressed and then I'll eat when I'm happy. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a bad relationship with food. Um, and I'm assuming that there's some kind, there's going to be some kind of like mental link to eating. That's going to make it really difficult to lose weight. But I would personally urge people to not like completely lose control. Like if you, if you're like, oh, it's not a choice, then I feel like it's going to encourage fat people to be like, oh, I can't lose weight anyway. I might as well not try, you know? Is obesity a choice? This is a tough question, and a lot of people seem to think about it something like this, where you have an obese button on the left and a not obese button Bro, on the right. I wish. And anyone who is currently obese is obese because they made a conscious decision to press the obese button. But I don't That's interesting. I know that sounds so weird, but no nobody wants to be obese. Most people don't. People who are already obese might have like gaslit themselves into thinking that they want to be fat, but they don't. So that's actually a really interesting way to, to start off the video. It's like nobody chooses to be obese in the first place. Um, I guess you'd, be, you'd argue that they choose to maintain it. I don't think that's how it works. I mean, for starters, if you selected 100 people at random and gave them the option, my guess is that almost every one of them would press the not obese yeah, button. True. People know about the potential health risks and social stigma that can come with being obese, so virtually no one would consciously choose to be obese in this true. simplistic sense. True. Maybe it looks something more like this, where you have this lifelong, continuous series of choices. Yeah, I would definitely take the choice on the left. Damn, that's why I'm obese. That right one doesn't look too bad, though. Choices ...to pick certain foods over others, like whether to order fried chicken or grilled chicken, regular Coke or Diet Coke, a small fries or a supersized fries, and certain behaviors over others, like whether to get up and exercise or stay on the couch. True. And over time, maybe it's the cumulative effect of these many individual choices that causes someone to become obese. I do yeah. think this is a bit closer to reality. Huh? However, even this analogy is still very incomplete. Consider this graph taken from a 1990 study where 24 subjects were overfed by 1,000 calories per day for 100 days, or just over... Damn. How much is that? How much weight would you gain? 1,000 calories a day, every day for 90 days, he said? From a 1990 study where 24 subjects were overfed by 1,000 calories per day for 100 days, or just over... Albert 100 Newton days. Albert Newton super $4.99. Hey, Papa. Hey, what's Love up, brother? stuff. Glad to see you still making enjoyable content less than three. I appreciate that, brother. Wait, so they said a thousand calories a day for a hundred days. Okay. And then we divide that by three because like 3,500 calories is like a pound. That's like a 28, maybe about a 30 pound weight gain, 28 and a half pound weight gain. God damn. Damn. Over three months. All the subjects were under 24-7 supervision by the research staff, so we can be confident they were actually following the protocol. Each one of these bars represents a single person, and the height of the bar okay. represents how much weight they gained in response to the same 1,000 calorie surplus. Wait, so you would expect them to gain about 30 pounds if they're in a 1,000 calorie surplus. So if we assume that they're eating 1,000 calories more than they were eating, that would be their maintenance calories. You would expect all of them to be at about 30 to 30 pound range, unless they allow these people to also supplement the increase of food with the increase of like um, physical activity. This person over here on the left only gained an extra 10 pounds, while this person over here on the right gained an extra 30 pounds while eating the same 1,000 calories extra per day. Interesting. This could be due to a number of factors, but a big one- And maybe lying about your maintenance calories, possibly. Is genetic differences in metabolism. Looking at this later study from 2018, we can see that just like there are large differences in weight gain, there are also large differences in how many calories people burn at rest. I th that, is, that, sh that shouldn't matter in any capacity to this at all. Um... That doesn't, that shouldn't matter at all. And the reason I'm saying that is because they asked them to overeat a thousand calories based on their current maintenance calories. That's what, that's what's being displayed to me. That's what I'm assuming. So then like you wouldn't, that part wouldn't matter. Like everybody is probably, everybody has different resting calories, right? Like my resting calories might be like 2,500. Yours might be 1,500. Somebody, whatever. That's fine. But like if we're, let's say we're all maintaining weight on the same, like let's say you eat a thousand calories a day and you're maintaining your weight and I eat 2000 calories a day. I'm eating more than that, but, and I maintain my weight and we each increase by a thousand calories, like 3,500 calories equals a pound. So everybody would roughly gain the same amount of weight. Like it wouldn't be this drastic. I don't think metabolism would have an impact here because again, we're already factoring in, um, those things increased like metabolism or increased like resting calories or you know those are already factored in from like the different processes there's different processes that we go through i don't think that would be a factor i would say that the people that didn't gain as much weight are probably being more physically active or they're just not eating the amount of food that they're saying that they're eating because like we said it's like if you 
we always say it like if you 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 will always lose weight if you go into a caloric deficit so you will always gain weight if you go into a caloric surplus like it's not like i don't think that that would be the factor for this they include exercise i'm assuming not because that's what i'm thinking is the biggest variable change see that just like there are large differences in weight gain there are also large differences in how many calories people burn at rest just sitting on the couch doing nothing at all this lucky person over here burns about 150 calories more than metabolic equations predict sure but that would be maintained in their resting calorie like their resting calories so that wouldn't have an impact and this person on the left would burn 250 calories less than metabolic equations predict in other words if none of these people exercised at all this person would still burn about 400 calories more per day than this so, person so that doesn't matter though going back to the buttons a small fries from mcdonald's has about 200 calories and a supersized fries has about 600 calories okay. all else being equal that's a 400 calorie surplus sure. if you choose to supersize but this person also burns 400 calories more so through no action of their own they could choose to supersize every time and their net caloric balance would be exactly the same as this other person who chooses the small fries that's fair but like we're kind of getting away from the study that he originally proposed this without the, the context of like the first study we're talking about that makes sense as to so why some people might be more overweight even if they're eating like the same amount of food because they have a different resting calories i totally understand what you're saying uh, but you would argue that the person that burns more calories doing nothing requires the more energy and they'll be more hungry as a response but either way again that's not going to shift the the change there the outcome of the first one right but this only considers resting energy expenditure the number of calories you burn at rest people also burn calories through exercise no. thermic effective food and something called non-exercise activity thermogenesis or neat and then like jerking off neat component of metabolism can vary dramatically between individuals even more than resting energy expenditure like jerking your dick off what is he talking about neat refers to the calories you burn from daily activities that aren't actual exercise so stuff like fidgeting tapping your feet etc and even though you can somewhat modify your neat levels by making an extra effort to move around a bit more throughout the day neat is still largely subconsciously regulated in the brain That's and fair. it's dynamic so if you have a genetic predisposition for low neat you aren't very hyperactive and you don't fidget much or even if it's not just a neck you might have like an environmental aspect to it like you might just like learn how to move more efficiently and just maybe like you know I go crazy in every movement, you know? And let's say you tried to force yourself to fidget more. In many cases, your brain would simply find a way to lower NEAT someplace else. So NEAT is, to a significant degree, outside of your control. And it can differ enormously between individuals. This study from Levine and colleagues overfed participants by 1,000 calories per day for eight weeks and found that NEAT levels ranged from negative 98, they actually moved around less, to plus 692 calories per day. This means that while both of these subjects ate an extra 1,000 calories per day, this person mm, quite literally fidgeted off about six. No. Both of these subjects moved moved around less calories per day for eight weeks, honestly, between individuals. The study from Levine and colleagues over um. fed participants by 1,000 calories per day for eight weeks and found that neat levels ranged from negative 98, they actually moved around less, to plus 692 calories. Okay, I'm having, I'm struggling with this article because somebody's not getting something right. And I want to explain to you why, because you probably like, probably got your fat fuck, you don't know what you're talking about. I just want to be, this is the way, maybe, maybe, let me just read this one. Humans show uh, considerable individual variations. We can't refine works. Overeating. Okay. Humans show considerable inter interindividual variation in susceptibility to weight gain in response to overeating. The physiological basis of the variation was investigated by measuring changes in energy storage and expenditure in 16 non base volunteers who were fed 1,000 kilograms or kilocalories per day in excess of weight maintaining requirements for eight weeks. Two thirds of the increase in Total daily energy expenditure was due to an increase in non-exercise activity, okay, which is associated with fidgeting, maintaining of posture, and other physical activities. Okay, I th interest. Okay, okay. Now that makes sense. I wasn't understanding something. That must have been to me. Okay, so let me explain to you what I what I was thinking, and then like uh, what they said, and like what what's the conflict here. So here's the way that I like interpreted the thing. All right, it doesn't matter. Like, okay, everybody has their own resting calories, all these other different things. At the end of the day, everybody will burn a certain amount of calories to maintain their whatever. So um, let's say that you maintain at three thousand a day, and somebody else maintains at two thousand a day. Either way, even if you increase their intake by a thousand for both of these people, um, if if these were the resting calories, you're still going to gain the same amount of weight overall, just based on the fact that 3,500 calories um, equals a pound, right? That's what it comes down to. So, however, what they're saying is that some people in a response to overeating are going to have more like involuntary movements that are going to change oh. potentially other weight gain. So maybe when some people eat more, they fidget more, they move around a little bit more unintentionally, maybe they have more discomfort, maybe they get up and take two shits a day instead of just one shit and that somehow burns calories. That's what they're saying. I wasn't really understanding that. I think that's on me. Okay, I got it now.
Study from Levine and colleagues overfed participants by a thousand um, calories per day for eight weeks. That's interesting. Exposure was due to increased non-exercise activity, which is associated with fidgeting, maintenance of posture, and other physical activities today. Changes in NEAT accounted for the tenfold differences in fat stores that occurred in directly predicted resistant fat game. Interesting. Okay. And found that NEAT levels ranged from negative 98. That makes more sense. moved around less to plus 692 calories per day. This means that while both of these subjects ate an extra thousand calories per day, this person quite literally fidgeted off about 700. That's fucking nuts. That kind of makes sense though, because I fidget a lot. I have, I have like legitimate ticks. Um... So I wonder, like, if all these, like, micro... And I keep my posture pretty decent. So, like, I wonder if, like, that has a profound impact on the fact that I don't really gain weight to the same degree as other people would gain weight with the amount I eat. It's interesting. ...of those extra thousand, while this person actually fidgeted less, meaning their body had to deal with all those extra 1,000 calories eaten, plus a little more. So, clearly, mm -hmm. anyone who's been genetically... Ah, blessed... interesting. Didn't even think about that either. Okay, so some people's response was to move less. Okay, interesting. ...with a high resting metabolic rate and high meat levels... Interesting. ...choose to press the junk food button many more times and still maintain a lower body weight compared to someone who's not as metabolically gifted. And this matches with our everyday experience. We all know someone who can eat whatever they want and remain almost uh, inexplicably thin. And we all know someone who's tried every diet book on the shelf yet remains overweight. Now... Hey, listen, don't... Try not to eat too much fruit. You know, because if you're fat, you probably got diabetes, right? It's Most people sugar. would be sugar, sugar. the thin yeah, person right. for their discipline and critique the overweight person for simply lacking willpower and making the wrong choices, not realizing the many baseline genetic factors that could be making it very easy for the thin person to stay thin and making it very hard for the overweight person to lose wow. any weight at all. But that's just metabolism. There's another big factor here, which is hunger. Research also shows that some people simply experience more hunger than others in response to dieting. Some people feel like they're constantly fighting their body's urge to eat oh, more, while okay, others feel that makes normal sense. hunger. Where it's low after meals. I know that when I smoke cigarettes, I don't get hungry very much. It's so fucked up, but dude. <laughs> Sometimes I'll smoke if, some, if I'm a little stressed. Uh, and I'll, I remember there'd be these days where I'll wake up and I'm like, I'm hungry. And I'll smoke a cigarette for breakfast and I'll have a cup of coffee and I'm just good for like six hours. I'm like, <laughs> it's fucking dumb as shit. It's not good. Don't do that. But it's crazy. Okay. And picks up as it gets closer to mealtime. Just consider this hunger study from 2013, which looked at the difference between eating a high-fat meal and a low-fat meal. Now, it turns out both the high-fat meal and the low-fat meal were able to suppress hunger very well on average. However, when that average trend was split up into individual subjects, you suddenly see this huge disparity between individuals. Some people were still quite hungry after eating the meal, others felt very full. And since hunger is what oh. naturally drives food intake for most people, we once again see that someone who still feels very hungry after a meal will have a harder time stopping compared to someone who feels full. So we've covered two genetic factors explaining why weight gain happens to some people more easily than others, even given the same food and exercise choices. But there are still so many other biological factors that can play a role, wow. such as whether or not you take certain medications that can increase appetite and water retention. There are also neuroendocrine conditions that can impact Interesting. But I imagine those those medications might also like increase or decrease your meat as well. Huh weight gain through hormones and metabolism. Then there's pregnancy and menopause, which have hormonal and metabolic impacts, and physical disabilities, which makes burning calories through neat and exercise more challenging. Now, yeah, of course, all this sure. doesn't mean that calories in, calories out only works for some people. No, it works for everybody objectively. It's just so interesting about like the relationship with food is so much more complex than I thought it was. It is a simple fact that obesity results from eating more calories than you burn. And tightly controlled yeah. metabolic word experiments repeatedly confirm that caloric intake is the driver of both fat loss and fat gain. 100%. So this means that anyone who is obese got obese by eating in a sustained caloric surplus over time. It's sure. just that avoiding that sustained surplus is so much harder for some people than it is for others and for reasons that are beyond their choosing. And this is why I think it's incorrect uh. to reduce all of these factors down to a simple choice to be obese or not. Because if wow. that were the case, why would obesity rates suddenly start trending up in the 1970s? Do people just suddenly start choosing to be obese? Or is there yet another layer to this? Well, well I mean, there's probably poorly regulated food, the, the advent of technology, uh, things of that nature. Well, no, I don't think that the spike was due to more people choosing to be obese, but rather from the fact that high calorie foods became so much more readily available for cheaper prices, meaning more people had yeah. more access to delicious, highly processed, high calorie foods. Fucking McDonald's ruined our lives, guys. And this leads us into the whole other side of this, which is the environmental factors. Yummy so foods. Entirely apart from the genetic and biological factors that we just went through, there are also environmental factors that can impact your susceptibility to obesity. This includes stuff like the food environment, where apart from the spike in availability, we also see better, flashier marketing for high calorie foods that promote overconsumption and large portion sizes. True. That makes a lot of sense too. People are very, I mean, myself included, very susceptible to shit like that. You see like a, you know, fuck. There's also the fact that junk food tends to be cheaper. True. More accessible for it's more processed. Longer. That's really what it is. There's a longer shelf life. 
people of lower economic incomes. And there are social factors, like the type of diet your family and friends eat, which can make it a lot harder, or in the case of dependents like children, virtually impossible to make so-called good choices. Then uh, yeah, that's a good point too. I mean, like if your parents teach you to be fat, <laughs> you know what I mean? If they're feeding you like shit, I, I get it. Because there's also the factor of like some people working a lot, like your parents working a lot, you know, an increased single motherhood. Um, you know, uh, causing people to, to turn to these fast food alternatives because they're fast and they're food, you know? Then there are the lifestyle factors, like how much sleep you get. And while it may be tempting to tell people to just get more sleep, that isn't always feasible depending on work and other responsibilities. True. In fact, this 2017 meta-analysis found that night shift work was associated with a 23% higher risk of being overweight. And this 2019 meta-analysis found a dose-response uh, relationship. Oh, probably because it's like more difficult to sleep during the day and get like a more well-rested sleep because your body naturally responds to light in like a wake-up way and like naturally responds to darkness and like a go to sleep by also makes you more depressed when you're I think like I'm pretty sure I don't remember the specifics but like when you are being up and or rather being up during the day and getting like that sun and that light it's it's has like a positive mental health impact on you I believe I'm pretty sure that's true it's not true pretending to say that but I'm pretty sure that's true um for sure yeah stress eating is a thing too yeah poor food poor hormones yeah that makes sense too there's a lot of fucking aspects here we really need to monitor like uh have the fda monitor our fucking fast food shit better between sleep duration and obesity risk less sleep meant more risk of being obese with seven yeah. to eight hours being the sweet spot on average nice. then there are psychological factors like stress and depression this 2010 meta-analysis of 14 studies found that stress was a risk factor for weight gain, and this other meta-analysis from the same year found that depression was predictive of obesity risk. So, coming back to the original question, is obesity a choice? Well, I think the answer is no, at least not in all cases, and certainly not in the simplistic sense. There's just too much of an influence from genetics and environment to shift the blame entirely on the individual for their circumstance. But that also doesn't mean that no one has any control over their health and their body weight. Clearly, if people want to lose weight, even if there are many factors working against them, such as low metabolic rate, high hunger, and so forth, it's still possible to lose weight if you sustain a caloric deficit over time. And I can link another video here explaining exactly how to do that, which okay. goes beyond simply eating less calories and delves into behavioral modifications that most people will need to make to have long-term success. Maybe I should watch that video. Ultimately, though, I think the smartest way to get lean shredding. Well, I don't care about getting that delves lean, into but... behavioral modifications that most people will need to make to have long-term success. Ultimately, though, I think the is obesity a choice question comes back to semantics. Perhaps what I mean by choice is slightly different from what you mean by choice, but I think that if you did want to argue that it is a choice so, in some sense, the best tomorrow. you could do is say that it's a complex series of choices intertwined with many other complex contributing factors. And so as people in the health and fitness space, I think we should make an effort to be more understanding of these factors and more compassionate toward people who are struggling rather than making assumptions. His mom could get it though, just saying about their choices and their characteristics. And then instead of blaming them for their circumstance, instead focus on pointing them in the right direction with good, sustainable nutrition advice when they ask for it. Oh. Now, I want to give a quick shout out to Dr. Mike Isretel for the button analogy. I love Dr. Mike Isretel. I first heard that. Bro, have you ever, if like, so I, like I, I said, I used to train more for like strongman and stuff. Never competitive, but I used to love training. And um, like, I would look at some of Mike Isretel's like stuff he has really good exercise science. Uh, I, I'm like putting stuff together. He's a smart guy. It's fun to listen to him. He, he's really good. He's very good. He's very realistic. Um, he really is very. He's a good. He's a really intelligent guy. I love that guy. That from him, and I thought it was great. And I'll also go ahead and link all the articles that I referenced in this video down below. And before we go, I want to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online oh, learning right. community that has thousands of classes for people looking to step up their creative game, whether that be learning about video editing or photography, marketing, business, and everything in between. Over the years, I've used Skillshare to help me learn more about video production and video editing to the point that I'm able to do any step in my own content creation process entirely on my own. And even though I do think that outsourcing can be helpful for certain things, I think that if you are in a creative line of work or if you want to be in one, I think being able to do these skills on your own gives you so much more power and control over your content. And Skillshare is amazing because in addition to giving you access to thousands of classes taught by fellow creatives, it also gives you access to a learning community of people who are also developing the same skills as you. Interesting way to sit. One of the things that's always been really important to me as someone who runs an online business is letting people know hmm. what it is that I have to offer without coming across as salesy, gimmicky, or cheesy. And if that's a skill. All right. Well, I think we got the Skillshare thing. If you want to go buy it. A free one month trial of Skillshare. All righty. That was a good video. I think tomorrow on stream, I'm going to watch the second one um the smartest way to like to get lean since he talked about how it has like behavioral benefits we'll talk about that thank you so much for watching guys and another special shout out to all my patreon and twitch subs if you'd like to support this channel further than you already have by just watching the video alone go down to the links below where you can sub on my patreon which will allow you to get your name on this beautiful black wall <laughs> uh, or you can go to the twitch page and you can actually use a free amazon prime sub if you have amazon prime to subscribe thank you very much guys take care